Welcome back. In our last session, we looked at Paul's initial efforts at evangelizing in Ephesus and his encounter with those who were baptized with the baptism of John the Baptist. Then we move to the interaction of Paul with the magicians, known as the sons of Sceva. This led naturally to the final episode we discussed in that session, the riot of the silversmiths incited by Demetrius and his compatriots. In our current session, we'll look at the aftermath of the riot of the silversmiths. When Paul intends to leave Ephesus and travel to Macedonia and Greece. From Greece, he then travels across to Troas, where he revives the youth Eutychus. From Troas, he travels south to Miletus, and there he gathers the elders of the church at Ephesus to speak to them for the last time. And we conclude our session with the departure of Paul from Miletus and his return journey to Caesarea, ending the third missionary journey. The text of Acts 20 begins noting that the disturbance that was the riot of the silversmiths has come to an end, but not without scars. Paul gathers the disciples in Ephesus and gives them encouragement following the riot, the traumatic experience of the riot. It's not a reason to give in, rather it's a reason to forge ahead with the mission of evangelization with ever more strength. Then he bade them farewell and began his journey to Macedonia. He was returning to Macedonia to revisit the churches he had established there to exhort them to keep the faith and allow them to grow. In essence, it was a pastoral visit to those churches. Finally, he arrives in Greece, where he remained for a period of three months. Let's take another look at the map of the third missionary journey. Paul departs from Ephesus and travels north to Troas, which was ancient Troy. Here he crosses the Aegean to Philippi and then visits in Philippi, Thessaloniki, and Berea before traveling south again in Greece to Athens, and finally to Corinth, as depicted in the green line marking his outward route. In Greece, he's planning to return to Syria via the direct sea route. However, there is a conspiracy against him that causes him to rethink that plan and change to the land route through Macedonia as far as Miletus. Then his companions on the journey are listed, seven of them who come from the churches he has established in both Greece and Asia Minor. Five of them travel with Paul, Sopater from Berea, who's listed as the son of Pyrrhus, Aristarchus and Secundus from Thessaloniki, Gaius from Derby, and Timothy. The other two went on ahead and met up with the Pauline entourage at, at Troas, Tychicus and Trophimus from Asia. Paul and his companions, after the Feast of Unleavened Bread, that is Passover, set out from Philippi and arrived in Troas five days later, And they spent after they spent a week in Philippi. On the first day of the next week, the community gathered to break bread. Kurtz notes that this is the first mention of a Christian liturgy on Sunday, the first day of the week. Paul then takes the opportunity to speak to the gathered community as he was about to depart the next day. And he realized that this may be the last time that he would see them. He had much to say and ended up speaking until midnight. Then Luke mentions a rather peculiar detail. There were many lamps in the upper room where they were gathered. Since it was night, it would be expected that there would be several lamps to light the room. 
Then the focus turns to a youth by the name of Eutychus, who was sitting on the windowsill and sank into a deep sleep as Paul spoke on and on. It seems Paul did not make a hit with the young crowd, but Luke won't admit that. Hence the point of the lamps. They were oil burning lamps which generated heat and smoke and tended to make people drowsy. So it wasn't Paul's talk, but the oil from the lamps that put Eutychus to sleep. Once he fell soundly asleep, he seemingly swayed outward and fell to the ground from the third story where they were gathered. As the people in the room rushed to his aid, when he was picked up, he was dead, or taken for dead anyway. Among those rushing to his aid was Paul, who leaned over him, lifted him up, and announced to the people, don't be alarmed, there is yet life in him. So Paul's actions, reminiscent of the raisings performed by Elijah and Elisha, bring the boy back to life. Then Paul and the assembly return to the upper room where they break bread and eat. Paul then continues to speak with them until daybreak. Then he departs. The people then take the boy away very much alive and are greatly comforted. Seemingly, Luke was with a group that departs via sea for Assos, while Paul continues overland to Assos, where he will meet the sea group as he had arranged with them. This is made clear by the use of the verb tuxain, which means to travel on foot, not by sea. So Paul then meets the sea group at, Ath at Assos, and they take him on board and continue to Mytilene. The boat travels by short stages, Assos to Mytilene, Mytilene to Chios, Chios to Samos, Samos to Miletus. Many of these stops were islands in the Aegean, known as the Greek Isles. They are approximately a day's journey by sea from each other. Again, we can see this section of the journey on the map. If you follow the green line from Assos to Miletus, they hug the coast of Asia Minor and travel southward. So the next day they arrive in Chios. The second day they sail to Samos. On the third day they arrive at Miletus. Luke then gives us a detail that Paul wished that they wished to sail past Ephesus. The construction in the Greek emphasizes, as Johnson notes, that this was a fixed decision of Paul, not a spur of the moment impulse. Could this be that danger still lurked at Ephesus for Paul? And it would be better for him to pass, pass up a stop there? Luke notes that the reason was to avoid spending significant time in Asia as he was hurrying to be in Jerusalem for Pentecost. Johnson, quite correctly wonders why stopping in Miletus, sending to Ephesus for a delegation to come to Miletus, and then waiting for that de delegation to arrive would take less time. The stage is now set for the farewell discourse of Paul to the elders of Miletus. The farewell discourse is a literary form that appears in Jewish and Greek writings. For example, the farewell discourse of Jesus to his disciples at the Last Supper in the Gospel of John, John chapters 13 to 17. Kurtz has noted significant different distinctive elements in the farewell discourse form. First, 
Paul addresses people who are succeeding him in his leadership role, the presbyters and elders who provide pastoral insight to the church. He has fulfilled his obligations, and it's thus time to move on. Second, he, imitate, he intimates that his death is near and prepares them for the future warning, the future warning them about crises that they will experience after his departure. To meet these, he gives a final blessing to them and prays with them. Third, and finally, he expresses his affection for them with a tearful goodbye. So, from Miletus, Paul sends to Ephesus, and he has the presbyters of the church of Ephesus summoned. This emphasizes the solemn character of the discourse that's about to follow. The verb used, metakaleomai, implies a summoning or calling to oneself to communicate something. When they arrived, Paul begins immediately. You know, he says, how I lived among you the whole time from the first day I came to the province of Asia. Paul sets himself forward as an example and a model of church leadership. It is thus not so much what Paul says, but what they have, sent, <clears throat> what they have seen him doing that's significant. How he lived among them is now explained in the next verses. I have served the Lord with all humility. He was always putting himself second, which led to tears and testing and from the plots that were hatched by the Jews in various places where he ministered, and especially in Ephesus. This notion of service reminds us of the servant of Isaiah who served others, and in that service suffered. Thus the humility and tears refer to the internal disposition of Paul, while the testings have been brought about by external forces. Secondly, he has not withdrawn from speaking or concealed what was for the benefit of the Ephesians. or from teaching them publicly or privately in their homes. Kurtz notes that this means that Paul openly, honestly, and courageously transmitted the entire gospel that he was commissioned to teach, including its less popular components. Oftentimes today, preachers will skirt about the more, the more dicey topics in the readings, not Paul. Then he notes that the message did not change when moving from Jews to Gentiles. I earnestly bore witness for both Jews and Greeks to repentance, that change of, of the way of life that Jesus proclaimed, metanoia, before God, and to faith in Jesus Christ. This was the past. Now, he says, I am compelled, bound by the Spirit, and that compulsion is leading him back to Jerusalem. That verb deo carries a, a notion of necessity. This is something that's not a choice. He is determined or obliged, bound to make the trip, no matter what it may bring. As he says, what will happen to me there, I do not know. There is a note of irony here, because in Jerusalem, Paul will find himself being bound, bound in another sense, as he is taken prisoner and bound in jail. But he does know one thing. Throughout these journeys, the Spirit has been witnessing to Paul that the chains... <clears throat> and prison and afflictions are what will await him. Paul continues to affirm that the threat of suffering is not a worry to him. I consider life of no importance to me 
if only I may finish my course and the ministry that I have received from the Lord Jesus to bear witness to the gospel of God's grace. Utilizing a metaphor drawn from racing in the games, Paul makes it clear that his only interest is finishing the work that Jesus has called him to do. He then sums up that work as to bear witness to the good news of God's gift or grace, which from the moment of his experience on the Damascus Road, through many other trials and tribulations, Paul has experienced. Then the actual farewell begins. But I now know that none of you to whom I preach the kingdom during my travels will ever see my face again. The starkness of this statement implies that Paul fears some eventual trial, imprisonment, or even death awaits him in Jerusalem. A consequence of this is that Paul now declares himself not responsible for the blood of any of them. He has carried out his mission from Christ, declaring openly to them all that they need to know. What they will do with that, what decisions they ultimately make based on that, is totally on their own. They're free to do what they want with Paul's preaching, accept it or reject it. He has done his part. He has not held back on anything, but rather declared the total, entire, and complete plan of God. Then comes the exhortation. Attend to yourselves and also to the whole flock, of which the Holy Spirit has appointed you as overseers. This is sage advice. People in positions of authority cannot care <clears throat> for those in their charge unless they first care for themselves. Hence, Paul places self-care before the care of the flock. Further, their rank is through the Holy Spirit who calls them to tend, literally shepherd the church of God, which he acquired with his own blood. This is one of the few times that we find Luke using the word episkopos. It's a word that ultimately designates those in the early church who are bishops or successors of the apostles. Yet here, it seems not to be so clearly defined. Luke seems to use it almost interchangeably with the word presbyteros. He then moves on to describe what they are to expect after he's departed from them. That is both from Ephesus and at his ultimate death. Developing on the image of the shepherd that he's employed in, previous, in the previous section, Paul notes that the flock will be in danger from savage wolves who will infiltrate it. They will not spare the flock. Kurtz sees this as warning the Ephesian elders that false teachers from the outside will prey on vulnerable members for their own advantage. The Greek word used here for spare, phaidomai, literally has the implication of withhold from ill treatment. But that's not all. From inside the flock, the community, people will arise who will speak deceitfully, literally distorted things, in order to draw the members of the community away after them. The elders and the members of the community, the flock, must be aware of the intent of those who address them both from outside and from inside. Are they prompting that they follow Jesus and his teachings, or are they presenting a version of his teaching that served to, present, to pr <clears throat> promote their own interests? Simply put, they're preaching Jesus, are they preaching Jesus, or are they preaching themselves? So, the flock must be vigilant or alert in order to recognize 
such false teachers and be ready to defend against them. Then he reminds them to recall how for the past three years he was in their midst and he did not cease to admonish them even to the point of tears. The verb that is translated as admonish can also be translated as warn or instruct. Thus, it has the sense of give instructions, in particularly regarding belief and behavior. So while he was with them, Paul instructed them on the way of Jesus. Now he's leaving them, so they must take up the task of applying that instruction to their lives. For that, he entrusts them to God. and to God's word, that is God, which is God's gracious, undeserved gift. That word, Paul notes, has a double effect. First, it can build up the community, especially in this case, in the sense of nurture, that is, assist the members of the community in that task of distinguishing their true teachers from their false teachers. Second, it bestows on the community an inheritance among those who they have made who have made them holy that is those who are destined to achieve eternal life as a reward for their holding true to the faith paul then reaffirms a point he has made consistently through his ministry i have desired no one's silver no one's gold or garments in other words He's been totally self-sufficient. The Greek verb epithemeo has the sense of desire, but also the notion of lust after or covet. That seems to reinforce Paul's notion of self-sufficiency. Paul now states this in a positive way. You know that these hands have served both my own needs and the needs of those who are with me. From the Acts of the Apostles earlier, we know that, Paul's that Paul practiced the trade of tent making, or in a broader sense, the trade of leather working. Through this, he saw to it that his needs and the needs of his companions were met. Kurtz observes, for Paul, it was extremely important to the credibility of the gospel that he did not depend on the fledgling, fledgling Christian communities for financial support. Simply put, Paul has worked for his keep and he has not expected anything to be given to him. Paul goes on, noting that he has pointed out, literally drawn a pattern or an example for the Ephesians of how they are to act. Now, using the verb day, he notes that working or laboring, they must come to the aid of, help, or assist those who are weak. Finally, Paul closes with an exhortation to remember the words of the Lord. He then cites a quotation of Jesus that we don't find in any of the Gospels, but which more than likely was repeated in the oral transmission of the Jesus tradition. It is more blessed to give than to receive. Or, as the New English Bible translates it, using a different nuance. When the address, when the address is finished, Paul falls to his knees. Other translations are not as graphic, saying simply that Paul knelt down. As he joins the Ephesians in prayer, the speech and the prayer have evoked great emotion among the Ephesians as they are weeping greatly. When the prayer has finished, they embraced Paul, kissed him, and bade him farewell. The whole scene ends with the note that they, the Ephesians, were anguished because of the word that Paul had spoken, namely that they would never see his face again. 
Seemingly, Paul knows that this will be his final visit to Ephesus, and with a great outpouring of emotion, kisses, and tears, the Ephesian elders accompany Paul to the ship, which will carry him to Caesarea and ultimately to Jerusalem. Well, this is a good place to stop for this session. Next time, we'll look at the conclusion of this third missionary journey with Paul in Tyre, Caesarea, talk about the Agabus incident, and finally his arrival in Jerusalem. In Jerusalem, we shall examine the hearing before James and the ensuing riot, which ends with Paul being arrested by the Romans.